CBT Nuggets ITIL Update Service Design Well, in the previous nugget of this update series, we looked at the service strategy. And service design requires its input from our service strategy. So we're going to continue with that discussion as we think about these inputs for example, like the service portfolio, where as an organization we have to gather our requirements and record and document these strategies as well as the constraints that our services need to meet. And so in this nugget on service design, first of all, we'll get an overview of what service design is. We will look at service level management. We'll look at supplier and service catalog management. We'll talk about capacity and availability management, some concepts that we've talked about already in the existing ITIL series. We'll look at IT service continuity management, information security management as it relates to service design, and then finally, the SKMS, the Service Knowledge Management System. Remember in the previous nugget where we talked about how service strategy is going to help us deliver our SLP, or our service level package. Well, service design is going to take those requirements, those needs, those goals that are contained in the SLP to allow us to design a service or make a change to the service or further meet those requirements. And when we design our service, we're going to take all of these components of that service into account. We're not just going to look at this from an IT perspective and look at the technical aspects. We're also going to widen our horizons or take off our IT blinders and look at the design of processes, different measurements, different knowledge that's going to be accumulated, our knowledge base, as well as tools. So taking into consideration all of the components, and then when we put this together, this design, this is going to the major output of this process will be what we call the service design package, or the SDP. So the service design package is basically the global output from the service level package. The purpose here is to design a new service or a modified service to deliver to environments to integrate the business process with information technology. It involves a wide variety of different types of components. It involves a management system and tools, and this could involve things like project management, management systems that come from applications like SharePoint, Microsoft, Microsoft SharePoint, uh, all the various tools that we use. It could be standardized architectures that we're building upon, a wide array of technologies, service management metrics, case studies, white papers, and the individual granular processes that goes into delivering these products and services. In service design, we have a wide variety of different goals. We need to meet the business objectives of the organization, whether it's our organization or our customer. It needs to be based upon or built upon things like quality and security, evaluating and handling risk, compliance with standards and mandates, overall IT governance, as well as the current business needs. We want to be able to enhance the efficiency and the effectiveness of information technology. We want to use good project management skills in this design process. We want to deploy solid tools and testing before we release our solutions to our customer. We want to develop solid policies and standards that are easy to understand and easy to implement. Along the way, we'll develop IT skills and capabilities that's what one of the main goals of this ITIL series is, is to enhance your IT skills and your overall management capabilities. We want to be able to transition from the drawing board and the steering committee ultimately to real operational tasks. We can talk about processes, we can talk about compliance and governance and tools and policies and standards, but eventually we have to really put this into action. And of course, that action plan is going to be driven by our project management skills. And again, another major goal of service design is to be able to contribute 
to the overall IT service improvement. And that's one of our main overall umbrella objectives, constant improvement of the services that we offer to our company, to different departments in our company, through our service desk, or to our customers as a service provider. Also for your exam, it would be beneficial to memorize the service design values to the business. What does it bring to the bottom line? Service design is going to allow us to lower the total cost of ownership. It'll help us to create a better quality of service, quality of service to our own company and to our customer. We want to provide improved service consistency, better service deployment or integration of services, all along the way, we're going to align the business needs to the services that we offer. We gain great value from improved IT governance, effective service management, and by building these IT skills, we're going to enhance the decision-making process as each member of the team becomes more effective, more knowledgeable, more consistent with the goal of constant improvement. You know, it's safe to say that having good design and good service design is going to pretty much guarantee that the service is going to meet the desired outcomes of our business or our customer's business, while at the same time conforming to constraints and requirements that we find during the service strategy phase, as we saw in the previous nugget. So it's vital that the service is designed based on the business needs, the business model. And all along the way, you want to continually verify that the service that meets those needs is being performed. You know, service design allows us to better focus on the business needs. This is critical. And having a good focus and a good understanding of the business processes is key. We can also measure the IT quality in terms that are measurable and better understood by end users and stakeholders. We can map the business processes to the IT infrastructure. Always measuring these services that we provide in their relation to business processes. Mapping infrastructure resources like networking resources and security resources, time, personnel, intellectual property to those services. We also can use this service design to bring value to the business by offering end-to-end -end performance monitoring all along the way. Bottom line, let's make sure that service design leads us into a, into a place where the business, where our services are business and customer oriented, they're focused, they're driven, they're cost effective and secure, always being flexible and adaptable, considering the ability to absorb ever-increasing demand, the increasing demands for continuous operation, available and responsive to changing business environments. The main goal of service level management is to make sure that you have a, an agreed level of IT service that's available for all of your current IT services, whether you're a service provider, whether these are for your enterprise, maybe a, a service desk. You also want to make sure through service level management that any services down the pike are delivered in measurable terms uh, with achievable targets. You're also trying to find and implement improvements all on the way to the levels of service that you deliver to your customers, and again this can be your internal organization customers, or to service provider customers, and end users. Service level management is really a liaison between an IT service provider and the customers. And to help us understand this liaison relationship, we want to look at base, some basic terminology here and define this. Now, one of the most common and one of the main portions of service level management delivery is the SLA the service level agreement. This is a written document, a written agreement between the service provider and the customer that's going to document any level of service that's agreed upon between the provider and the customer. This is a main aspect of service level management. Along with that we have the service catalog. We've discussed this already. This is a kind of a statement of the available IT services. Think of it as a menu, for example. Uh, the default levels of service, the options that you have, uh, describing these options, processes, how the customers can use them, and of course costs and pricing along with that. 
Then we have some other definitions we want to understand. We have UC, which is the underpinning contract. Let me jot that down. We also have the OLA, which is the operational level agreement, and SLRs. SLRs are service level requirements. The UC, or the under, underpinning contract, this is the contract that you have with external vendors or other suppliers that support the IT organization and service delivery. Negotiating and agreeing upon the service level agreements, as well as the operational level agreements, which are basic internal agreements with other areas of the same organization that support the IT service provider, these are the responsibility of service level management. So the SLA is between the corporate level and the customer, whereas the OLA is within the corporate level between different departments of the same organization. And then SLRs, service level requirements, this is a detailed documentation of all the customer's needs and goals where you help to form the design criteria of a new service or a changed or modified service. The roles of operational level agreements and underpinning contracts are basically agreements with things like the service desk or human resources or software development for example as well as external suppliers and vendors and how we support the IT organization to meet the service level agreement that we have with our customers. Service level management performs tasks during the service design life cycle phase. This means determination, negotiation of contracts, and producing the results. You can have a customer-based and service-based service level agreement where you've got individual customers with different services or you could have a multi-level SLA structure where you could have the enterprise or the service provider here at the corporate level. You can have multiple customers. These customers can be internal or external. And then, of course, each one of these customers could be implementing a different service, service A, service B, service C, and so on. And you can have service level agreements which apply to each one of these services a la carte off of the menu, or you can have a service level agreement that addresses all of the provided services and the other options that are available. And again, this is all supported by the IT infrastructure and the underpinning contract and the operational level agreements. So your service level management is going to have different structures, different hierarchies to meet different needs, different sizes of organizations. Uh, you want to make sure in your SLA structure that you aren't duplicating a lot of your efforts or your services. You want to also know who, who needs to sign off on the service level agreements at the corporate level and at the customer level. Who are the authorized signers, the authorized signatures? At the corporate level here, you've got all of your main global and generic issues covered. This should be the same for you know all of the organizations. So for example, if it's from a security standpoint, it's the corporate security baseline, the security policy, uh, password policies, uh, corporate identification cards and badges, those types of things. At the customer level, these will be specific things that the customer deals with for you know so like for, for business units or departments or for branches or for independent retail customers for example and then the service level or the is the is the menu of the services provided encryption services cloud computing backup services dynamic multipoint vpn services things like that now what about the service level agreement? What are some of the contents? And this is kind of similar to when a company is putting together a written security policy or governance. You want to have some type of template, some type of structure. So some of the common contents or common sections of a service level agreement would be things like the overall introduction to the agreement and the scope of the project or the scope of the agreement. A description of the services. Mutual responsibilities between the customer 
and the provider or the service desk and the customer, or the service desk and the users, the applicable service hours and availability. Is it 24-7 service hours? Do you need to have 9.99% uptime? That needs to be defined. Uh, an agreement about customer support and tech support. Who are the contact points and information about those contacts on both sides? The provider and the client. Escalation terms. Uh, what does it take to escalate this up to different levels of tech support and different levels of management? Uh, service performance and security objectives. Again, what services are being provided? Batch turnaround times for batch jobs. And of course, overall costs, charges, chargebacks, and accounting mechanisms. These are all the things that you might find in a service level agreement. You can always go up to your favorite search engine and look for some sample, maybe PDF files of a SLA, just to kind of give you an idea of how these things look if you haven't dealt with them already uh, in your own experience. Let me give you an example. You can find these readily available up on the internet. Here's a service level agreement. This is a sample. It says it's a short form contract to document the service level agreement and a monthly status report. You can see, you know, re, you know, goals, actual difference, response load, act, uh, accuracy, batch service criteria, and you can, sc uh, you know, scroll through this and see different areas that are services that are this particular company provides email MVS systems VM systems network availability performance so it should give you a good idea of the type of thing that you would find in this service level agreement along with the typical contents that I just showed you on the previous slide but uh, make sure you spend some time and go up and find some sample SLA templates up there to give you a better idea you will you will not be tested specifically for different uh, granularities of an SLA, but you should have a general idea of the types of things that are going to be covered in a template agreement. Okay, we're going to do this all along the way, but before we go any further, I want to look back at that overall process, the life cycle. Here at the core, we have the IT infrastructure library and then of course service strategy we looked at that in the previous nugget here we have service design where we're at now we've talked about service level management we're going to look next at supplier management so in this particular phase you have supplier management service level management service catalog management and availability management we can also put into this area capacity management as well let's talk next about supplier management the main goal of supplier management is to manage the suppliers, okay, and their supplied services. You're basically offering a fluid quality of service to the business itself. We want to get value for the money from our supplier and our contracts. We want to make sure that the underpinning contracts, the UCs, and the agreements that we have with suppliers are in line with our business needs. We also want to manage relationships with vendors and suppliers, negotiate and agree upon contracts, manage supplier performance, and also maintain supplier policy with a supporting SCD, that is the Supplier and Contract Database. This supplier and contract database can be stored, practically speaking, in a MySQL database or Microsoft SharePoint, but it's a data store that's going to store the supplier strategy and written policy, different evaluations of the suppliers and vendors, all the new contracts, tracking of management and performance, any contract renewal and termination tasks, and categorizing the different suppliers and vendors as well as ongoing supplier maintenance. In the best case scenario, the supplier and contract database should form an integrated system of comprehensive CMS or a comprehensive configuration management system. It can also be supported by the SKMS, the Service Knowledge Management System. And as I said, it can be a wide variety of different products out there, relational database management systems, or something like Microsoft SharePoint. Obviously, we can create different relationships with our suppliers and our vendors. Here's an example of kind of five different arrangement types as it relates to supplier management. First of all, we have what's called co-sourcing. This is basically combining insourcing and outsourcing 
in a very informal way implementing and leveraging a bunch of different outsourcing organizations that are functioning in concert to provide key elements of our life cycle. You can also look at partnership or multi-sourcing. These are formal arrangements between two or more organizations that are functioning to, to design, maintain, operate, and support IT services. Here, you tend to be a little bit more like strategic partnerships where you're leveraging pockets of expertise or maybe special market opportunities with these strategic partners. You've got business process outsourcing. These are also formal arrangements where you have an external organization providing and managing the other organization's entire business processes or functions. This could be like a consulting firm maybe an accounting firm, or bringing in an organization to manage payroll or a call center. You've also got knowledge process outsourcing. This is a relatively new enhancement where external organizations provide domain-based processes and business expertise instead of just the process expertise. Maybe advanced analytical and specialized skills. Then we have application service provision. This is computer-based services to customer organizations over a network. Again, database services, shared software, cloud computing, Microsoft SharePoint, supplier arrangements. The next aspect of service design is service catalog management. For most IT organizations, the process of managing the service catalog is going to serve as the, the fundamentals for most of the work involved within the scope of the service offerings and service agreements. The main goal of service catalog management is to make sure that you have a service catalog that's produced, often in a hard copy and a web-based format, maintained, and that the catalog always has the right information and data concerning all the different operational services as well as those that are being developed. It's a mechanism for making transactions between the customer and the provider easier and more effective. It's the process of managing the services that are offered. The existing and anticipated customers, the development and management of service portfolios, service level agreements, IT budgets, and more. It's making sure that the catalog is accurate, updated, and relevant producing the service catalog and having it ready to deploy. Think of your service catalog as your single source of the services that are offered by the service provider or the service desk or IT department for the organization, making sure that services are highly available and widely available. The OGC has developed some different models for business catalogs and technical service catalogs. Here's an example of where you divide up your business processes and again we're going to be combining really two different catalogs as I mentioned you've got a business service catalog and you've got your technical service catalog the business service catalog has all the details of the IT services uh, for customers along with relationships to business units business processes that they support the technical service catalog has details of the IT services delivered to the customer, but it's different than the business service catalog because it has records of the relationships that exist with other supporting services, vendors, consultants, shared services, other technical relationships. So one way to break this out is to have your business processes. For example, you could say we're providing uh, Cloud computing services is business process one. Wide area network VPN is business process two. Then within those processes, we can have other a la carte services. Some of these can be cross-pollinated to other business processes, but within an ind individual service, you have just different components that are going to provide solutions. So for example, under the service C here, which we could call, let's say, web services, from our cloud computing process, we can have support services, we can have web software services, uh, our web servers, our blade servers, 
the actual back-end database for those web services and other productivity apps or business apps that are using the HTTP protocol. Now we had an entire nugget on capacity management in the original ITIL series and capacity management does fall under service design. The goals of capacity management are to make sure that the current and future performance and capacity demands on customers are provided through our IT services. In capacity management we manage and control the right capacity at correct locations at the right time for specific customers with specific or precise costs. Some of the sub-processes of capacity management would be business capacity management, service capacity management, and component capacity management. Business capacity management is going to look at meeting the future business requirements for IT services, identifying any modifications that happen in the business, assessing how they might impact capacity and performance of IT services, also planning implementation of sufficient capacity in the right time frame, and it should be combined with change management and project management schedules. Service capacity management will look at managing ongoing service performance as detailed in service level agreements. Do we have the capacity to handle the agreements that we have with our customer? It establishes baselines and profiling the use of services, all the components and subservices that actually affect the end user. And then component capacity management is identifying and managing all of the individual components of the IT infrastructure. For example, uh, disk subsystems, network bandwidth, server load, memory, CPU, quality of service, security. It also evaluates any new technology and how we might use this technology to provide our solutions. All three of these sub-processes are going to take their data and the reports that they generate and they're going to deliver those to service level management as well as financial management. Here's a nice practical list of some of the capacity management tasks or activities that will take place under this umbrella of capacity management. We'll look at things like performance monitoring of our servers, of our firewall, our security appliances, uh, our routers, our switches, demand management, demand from the end user for data resources, for network resources, for other shared resources, application sizing, making sure that we have the right platform for the applications, data modeling, uh, tuning of our intrusion prevention systems, in, uh, tuning of our databases, data storage, backup and restore, capacity planning, and ongoing monitoring and reporting. These are all capacity management activities. Availability management is also uh, one of the nuggets that was covered under the original ITIL series and it's also an area that's under the life cycle umbrella of service design. The goal of availability management is to make sure that service availability levels meet or exceed the needs of the customer and it's done in a cost effective manner. As a service provider we don't want to provide any services that are going to actually be a loss for our company. A loss leader is one thing, but it has to be a cost-effective solution on the provider side and the customer side. The goal is to reduce the length and the number of incidents through forward-looking availability plans. It goes directly to customer satisfaction. Remember, in the SLA, part of the agreement is what percentage of uptime do we guarantee and what does the customer expect? making sure that duration and outcome of incidents have a minimal impact on IT services. We also want to make sure that we can define some availability management metrics. Uh, for example, we've got MTBF, which is mean time between failures. This is also referred to, as I just uh, talked about, as uptime. It's the average time between the recovery from one incident and the occurrence of the next incident and it relates to the reliability of the service. We also have MTRS, which is the mean time to restore the service. MTRS is actually downtime. It's the average time that we take to restore 
a configuration incident, or an IT service after a failure. It's measured from when that failure occurs until when it's fully restored and delivering at normal functionality. Then we have MTBSI. This is the mean time between system incidents. And this is the average time between the occurrence of two consecutive incidents. Think of this as like uh, in a factory where they have, you know, the big sign that says 79 days since the last injury those types of things. That's MTBSI. It's actually the sum of the MTRS and the MTBF. IT service continuity management is also commonly referred to as a disaster recovery plan. It's also a key part of service strategy you're supporting the overall business continuity management and business impact analysis by making sure that the required IT infrastructure and service provision can be recovered within a certain period of agreed business time scales. BCM or business continuity management is basically the actions that take place to continue business processes when a disaster occurs. It's important that your overall strategy is integrated into the BCM strategy. And BIA, or Business Impact Analysis, quantifies the impact loss of IT service if it occurs and what happens to the business. Another key aspect of this is risk analysis and risk assessment, which should be performed at all costs to evaluate your assets, look at your threats and vulnerabilities that exist to the business processes, to the infrastructure, to the IT services, and other assets. You want to consider all the identified critical business processes and supported IT services. And this includes things like staffing, hardware, software, all the essential services and utilities. What would you have to recover into either a cold site or a warm site or a hot site solution? to be able to keep the business operating, your core records of uh, voice services and data centers. This is really a four-phase process. In phase one, the initiation process, you're going to define the scope of the BCM, the business continuity management. In stage two, you've got your requirements and strategy. This is where you do your business impact analysis and your risk assessment and analysis and your business continuity strategy. In the third phase, you have what's called implementation. This is where you do your organizational implementational planning. You take your measures to reduce risk. You have recovery plans and procedures and you do your initial testing, your pilot tests. And then finally in the fourth phase, you have operational management. And this is where you're going to provide overall assurance through a wide variety of mechanisms. In the operational management phase, you'll deal with things like education and awareness of your users. You'll do reviews and you'll do audits. You'll do testing, penetration testing for example. You'll test out the recovery services and also in this area change management comes into play. All this with the goal of providing assurance to the stakeholders of the provider or the organization as well as to the customers. Business impact analysis identifies five major things. Your core business processes and key business functions. It, it identifies the possible loss caused by a disruption, the potential escalations caused by the loss, resources needed for business continuity, and the time restraints needed to recover, minimum recovery and complete recovery of all the services and facilities. The final major aspect of design is to look at information security management. And the goal of this is to align business security with IT security. It involves the effective management and control of IT service management delivering confidentiality, integrity, and authentication or availability for all assets, physical and logical assets. 
confidentiality is brought to us using encryption mechanisms and decryption mechanisms like IP security or SSL TLS VPNs or other technologies integrity is done through hashing mechanisms making sure that data and traffic is not modified in an unauthorized fashion and then availability availability of systems making sure that information is available and usable when needed and that the systems that provide that information can resist different types of attacks denial of service attacks buffer overflow attacks worms and viruses and be able to recover from failures as well as prevent the failures that's known as a security triad confidentiality integrity and availability it also involves developing a security baseline a place to start that can also tie into anomaly detection that we use in intrusion prevention systems to build security baseline knowledge bases and look for anomalous behavior on top of that as well as a written security policy Information Security Management, or ISM, is a major part of our IT governance framework. ISM is going to consider organizational security policies, procedural policies, physical controls, and technical controls as well. This control can be done through four phases, or four steps, one, two, three, and four. Uh, first, we have the threat, various security threats to our infrastructure. We want to prevent or reduce the damage of these as much as possible, but you're always going to have incidents. You can't have 100% incident-free environments, so in the case that you do have worm attacks or viruses that get past the firewalls and the intrusion prevention systems and the hardened servers and routers and appliances, you have to have detection techniques and incident response. Of course, you need to have damage control. When the incident occurs, you're going to have some damage. You want to minimize the damage. You want to repress the damage and then correct any damage that's caused and recover your infrastructure back to the baseline levels that we've developed previously. And then finally, ongoing control and management. Uh, the ongoing monitoring and reporting and reviewing and auditing of why the breach occurred, how successful were we in responding to the incident and managing the damage, and what mitigation or countermeasures are put into place to prevent that from happening again. Another key concept of service design is this marriage of software and hardware that equals what we call the SKMS, okay, the Service Knowledge Management System. This is where you're going to store all of the data concerning a particular service or multiple services. And this SKMS is also used by other aspects of the life cycle, other phases of the life cycle, not just in service design. This is going to include things like service scripts, all the service designs, potential problems and challenges, all the other information that go into service delivery. All of your service portfolio items, the menu of the services you provide, and all of the details and parameters and attributes of those services are all stored in this database, this SKMS. It can be a custom application that's developed by your in-house programmers or maybe a third-party vendor. It could be an extension of a full-blown database, relational database management system like uh, MySQL or uh, Microsoft SQL Server or Oracle. It could be a commercial platform that is Microsoft SharePoint on the front end going to SQL servers on the back end. And again, it's, it's a marriage, it's a combination of software and hardware uh, that we're going to build and we're going to store and we're going to process and we're going to do data mining and reporting on all of this information that's going to lead to an effective and efficient service design policy and strategy. In this ITIL update nugget of the ITIL series, we looked at service design. First, we started out looking at an overview of the components and aspects and characteristics of service design. We looked at service level management supplier management and service catalog management, capacity and availability management, IT service continuity management, and then the final aspect, 
or the final phase of this part of the life cycle, information security management. We also finished up talking about that combination of software and hardware that delivers our service knowledge management system, the SKMS. I hope this ITIL CBT Nugget has been informative for you. I want to thank you for viewing.